we are going to be looking at this tonight. So let's look, uh, beginning in verse 1. And we'll just take this a little bit at a time here. It says, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus, speaking, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. And then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, or ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. So here we have this second year of King Darius. And it's interesting that in this chapter, the next chapter, uh, Haggai, this prophecy gives us some, some marking points. You notice in verse 1, it will say this in the second year of, king, of, of Darius the king in the sixth month. And then if you'll drop down to verse 15, that say, it says in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. And then over in chapter 2, verse 1, in the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, and then again in verse 20 of chapter 2, again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying. So here we have these chronological markings that basically say God is, imp God is impressing on these people when these things are happening, okay? It's important to understand this. Now, Haggai was probably the first of the post exile it uh, 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 prophets, meaning after the exile, there were, there were like three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These prophets were after the Jews came back, okay? And um, all the other prophets were from before. And so you have this kingdom that had been so glorious in the time of David, and especially in the time of Solomon, with this beautiful temple that Solomon had built that was the envy of the world. People would come uh, thousands of miles to see this temple and to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So Israel was among one of the wonders of the world as far as being a kingdom uh, that excelled all other kingdoms. And why? Because they were faithful to God. Okay? Uh, Solomon began to slip and the kingdom began to slip away, but God had made a covenant and made a promise, and so he kept it intact. But it was because of God's uh, keeping them that they were so well respected by all the other nations. So here you have, though, they've come back from exile. They've been gone for 70 years. They have gone into captivity. Why? Well, they went into captivity because of their idolatry, didn't they? And, um, and so here we find that he, when they're coming back, the, the glory of the former kingdom and temple, they're gone. There's nothing like that. It's just a wreck. It's a mess. Stuff is everywhere. Rocks and, and lumber and trash and everything else is just it is, 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 is spread all over the place. And there's no more glory. It's just rubble. Uh, in 538 B.C., Cyrus, king of Persia, allowed the exiled Jews to return to Jerusalem after 70 years. And two years later, in 536, they began the construction of the temple. Okay, They started to build this temple. Uh, Zerubbabel led them to do that. But then in 534 B.C., the work stopped and uh, for some unknown reason. And for 14 years, it just was there. Nothing was being done on it. It was just left... Uh, to just sit there. And then the, the work is resumed then in 520 B.C. If you read in the book of Ezra, you'll see some of these things are taking place because Ezra was responsible for getting this temple uh, rebuilt. So it's interesting that this pagan king Cyrus uh, believed more in God than God's own people did. Even though he probably, you know, some people say, well, you think Cyrus was a Christian? I don't know because they didn't really have Christians then. But he... 
He came to believe in this God, at least to accept the fact that he was God and that he had a people and these people were supposed to go back and Cyrus sent them back and made sure that they had what they needed, okay? He's paying for things to be rebuilt. So there's something about him, uh, even though he was a pagan king, okay? Um, then the word of the Lord comes to Haggai. And it comes to him... Why? Because the people are not being faithful to take care of what they're supposed to be taking care of. Uh, back in Ezra chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says, Then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Edo prophesied to the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, even unto them. And so they were there to prophesy and to tell them what God wanted them to do and wanted them to know. Now, the name Haggai is, uh, is a, it, it's probably an abbreviated form because it means literally the festival of Yahweh, the festival of, of the Lord. And uh, so some people think he might have been born on that date. doesn't really matter, but that's what his name meant. Now, look in verse 2 because here we come to some of the heart of this prophecy here uh, that I think will speak to us as well in 2020. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. A time has not come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Now, why were they sent into captivity? Because of their idolatry. Look, if you would, back to the book of 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 17. And look at this of why they went into captivity. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 17, beginning in verse 7. 2 Kings 17, beginning in verse 7. For so it was that the, king, that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the statutes of the heathen whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill under every green tree, and there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. And yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, and which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. And notwithstanding, they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies, which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them, concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to, to anger. And therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made. And the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them to the hand of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. And he rent Israel from the house of David and they made Jeroboam the son of Nebat king and Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them sin a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did. They departed not from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all his servants, the prophets. So was Israel carried away out of their own land to Assyria unto this day. Now, idolatry 
uh, wickedness. They had not kept the Sabbaths. They had not observed the things of the Lord. And so for 70 years they have been in exile because of their sin. And it's amazing what God did. God sent them to a land filled with idolatry, filled with idols. I mean, in, in Babylon, all of Assyria, there were idols everywhere. And if there weren't enough idols, then you had kings like Nebuchadnezzar who built a statue to himself and said, bow down when you hear the music play. I mean, they, they, it was all about idolatry. So that's why they were there. Now, did they know why they were there? Yes, they knew why they were there. God had sent prophets to remind them why they were there. So here they are coming back. And what do they do? They say, oh, it's, not, it's not the time for the Lord. Uh, for us to build the house of the Lord. They didn't learn anything. They came back, they started, and they got the foundation laid, and then uh, they kind of fizzled out. And why? Well, I'll tell you why, and it's going to show you this, because they, they were worried about themselves. You see, hey, we've got we to get our own houses built. We got to get our own crops growing. We got to we got to get our families established. We got to get everything going again. You know, we can work on that on that temple anytime. And it's not that important because it, you know, we have the foundation for it. We know where it's supposed to go and we have an altar built, so we got that taken care of. That'll be good enough. And that's how many people are today, isn't it? You know, I know I don't have everything together as far as the Lord is concerned, but I've got to get these things done for my family because if I don't, I won't be able to do anything else. I want to point out to you, your family, as, as important as it is, it will never, ever be as important as the Lord is. Never. Jesus said, seek you first, what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But so many people today seek all the other things. And the Lord is not added to them because He demands to be first place. So here they are. They had started this, but the time has not yet come. Now, you know, we could look at this and we could identify with it, I'm sure. You know, the desolate land neglected for 70 years. I mean, my back grass in my yard, I really don't like it. And um, I had hopes one day of putting this wonderful lawn in and it was put in and I'm not really a lawn guy. And um, so now what happens is that my lawn during the summertime is like about that tall, okay? It's dead, okay? And it's brown. But in the wintertime, when it rains, it gets taller and taller and taller. I don't even know what kind of grass is growing back there. I've never seen grass like that, okay? And, um, and it grows and grows and grows. Well, can you imagine if I didn't cut it, didn't do anything for 70 years? It will be growing everywhere. Well, this is what they're looking at. 70 years, nothing's happened, so we got to get on it. The work is hard. It's hard work to build the temple. And they didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have a lot of manpower. Their crop failures in chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it talks about this, about crop that says, Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from their fall. I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the corn. You see, they don't understand that the drought and all the problems they're having is because of what? They're not building the temple. God wanted them to take care of that stuff first. They had enemies. Ezra, at Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, talks about these hostile enemies that would come against them. And plus, they remembered the easier times in Babylon. There's no work. We didn't have to do any work. Remember the Jews coming out of Egypt and they started to complain and murmur, oh, that we had the onions and leeks that we had back in Egypt. 
Oh, that we could go back there. It was much better there, Moses. I don't know why you let us out here. You see, what people that follow the Lord need to understand is that the work of the Lord is a blessed work, but it is not an easy work. It is a hard work. It requires effort. It requires losing sleep. It requires sacrifice. And where is that today? Now we can, we can even look at our own facilities. Oh, you said, I knew you were going there. Well, let me just say this because I think it's very important. Although we don't have a temple here by any means, we have what has been dedicated as the house of the Lord. So I would say this, that if something is broken at your house, you would fix it, right? I mean, if a door fell off or something like that, you'd probably want to get that fixed, right? You know, and I wouldn't blame you because you need to have a door on your house fixed, especially if it was a door that came into the center of your house called the kitchen. And, and here you have a door has, has fallen off. And, and so you're going to call whoever you can call. You might call somebody and say, hey, do you know a uh, you know, workman that can come and, and, and do this? And um, you'd get somebody to do that. But what if it's the house of God? Would you be willing to fix the house of God before you fixed your own house? This is what Israel is doing here. The Jews are not taking care of God. Notice it says uh, in verse 4, he says, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now that word sealed has nothing to do with the ceiling. Okay? It has to do with the paneling and the, and the elaborate work that is done in the house. You have all this wonderful stuff you've done in your own house, but you let the house of God lie waste. Now, I would not say that we need to do this, but I remember uh, uh, the last time <laughs> that I had gone with uh, Vladimir to Russia, and this was, you know, this was the time Vladimir wanted to show me everything he could show me in between preaching places. He wanted to show me all of these elaborate things in Russia. And here's the thing that I noticed. Is that one day I saw some men up working on top of one of the cathedrals. And they're putting in, you know, this brass, like copper-like stuff on the, on, on the roof, okay? And Vladimir is explaining to me and he says, he says, only the old men know how to do this work, but they're too old to do it. So you see, they have two other guys up there. They're young men and they're teaching them. They're showing them how to do this work because the churches have to reflect the glory of God. You can't have wood and things like that on top of your church. It has to be something that, that reflects back the light to God. That, you know, that's interesting. And then going into those cathedrals, you see all this elaborate, it's not fake, it's all gold all along the insides, all around. And they had gone and, 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 and got this stuff back because the communists had destroyed so many of the churches. Some of the most beautiful churches were turned into feed lots for cattle. And uh, one church was turned into a swimming pool. The whole church was filled up with water. Um, so they had to go redo this. But you look in there and all this elaborate gold work and all this stuff. And it's beautiful. I mean, I'm an American. I don't really appreciate all of that so much. But, you know, I could see that this meant something to these people. Well, I, I think the house of God should mean something to us that we should say, well, what can we do to make this a more glorious place to worship God in? Not with statues and all the other junk that people have, but just to say this deserves the very best we can do. It may not be expensive, but it's the best we can do. You know, that's why growing up, and uh, I don't want to get off on these tangents, but I want to tell you because we live in a time now where people don't really think coming to church is that big of a deal. Okay, but I grew up in a time when, you know, you wore 
you wore what they called your Sunday best on Sunday. And those clothes were laid out on Saturday. And the shoes were polished. And everything was set up. If you were looking for shoes on a Sunday morning in my father's house, you, you would not be able to sit for several days because that was the law. Get things ready. We're going to church. If people would drop in to visit us as they would occasionally driving sometimes three and 400 miles from other cities in Alaska to come and visit us, my father would say, well, it's Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. Uh, you're welcome to come to church with us or you can wait here. We'll be back in a couple hours. Now, that was how it was, but many people today say, oh, I wouldn't think of going anywhere if someone dropped in. That would be so rude. Isn't it rude to not worship the Lord on His day? It was a different time. I understand that. We're much more important these days, and we have you know, other things we have to take care of, and, and uh, God will just have to understand. But no, no, we, we need to understand is that to dress up, and yet, you know, I've, in 35 years that I've been here, I, you know, I don't make a big deal out of clothes. I don't think you ever heard me talk about what you should wear to church. Okay, I don't do that. But I have seen people come looking like they just rolled out of bed. And I'm thinking, come on. You didn't have anything. I saw you, I, when I would say to the person, I've seen you at work the other day. You were dressed better than that. Well, God just takes us as we are. No, he doesn't. When people say, God just takes you as, you know, he will accept you as, as you are. No, he doesn't. There's not one of you that God accepted as you were. He changed you. He gave you a new heart. You see, we want to try to bring God down to a level. Well, that's what these people were doing. They're basically saying to God, our homes, our families are more important because you sent us off into exile. And so here we are, we've got to get this stuff put together, and then we'll have time to build this. But I just think it's not the time. They said it's just not the time. One commentator says that because the Jews came back, they left, actually, they were taken into captivity, not all at the same time. Okay? They, they, they went out in waves of people over a period of several years. And so this commentator says, well, perhaps what they're saying, it's not the time because God is going to do this at the end of 70 years and we came back early. I don't think that's what it is. Okay. But there are many people that have the idea, well, when God wants something done, he'll get it done. It's kind of like uh, when um, we we're talking about earlier with about David Livingston, the, the Scottish missionary to, uh, to Africa, uh, responsible for opening up. Africa, north, south, east, and west, mapped the whole continent out. And uh, here we find that when he went to the missionary society in, in, in Scotland that was going to send him out, he said, I want to go to Africa and preach to the natives. And they said to him these words, Mr. Livingston, when God wants to save the natives, he will save them. He doesn't need you. Because that was the attitude of many people. When God wants to save someone, he'll just save them. And so Livingston had to go through someone else. And there are many, many, many Africans over the years that have been so glad that he did. You see, you have to put the Lord first, don't you? All the time. Um, Look back, if you would, to the book of Ezra just for a moment. All right. If you are there in Nehemiah, you are almost there. Ezra and chapter 3. This was the attitude of the people when they began to do the work at first. They came back with the right attitude. In, in, in chapter 3, in verses 10 and 11, it says, as soon as my thumb will turn this page, uh, it says, And when the builders 
laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by chorus in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy endureth forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. They were excited when they laid the foundation. Can you imagine coming to church on a Sunday morning and people are shouting with a great shout just to be here? You see, we in America, we kind of have twisted things around to where we think we're supposed to get something out of worship. We're supposed to. And so we might go and say, well, I don't really get anything out of worship. You're not supposed to. because We're not worshiping you. Now, there's a certain joy in worshiping the Lord, but we're not coming to worship for us. We're coming to worship him. Now, if you've ever watched children play and something they really enjoy is happening, are, are they whispering about it? Are they saying, hey, throw the ball. Yeah, I made a, yeah, made a touchdown over here. I don't know. No. They're shouting, they're laughing, they're jumping, they're screaming. We call those charismatics. But they're really not. They're the poor charismatics many times are just simply worshiping emotion just to worship emotion. Not really worshiping the Lord. But when we come and worship the Lord, we're worshiping for what? For who He is, what He has done, what He has promised. We're worshiping His perfect word that He has given to us. And so they were excited, but then over time, they went backwards, didn't they? And we have to watch that. When someone begins to drift away from the things of God, We ought not simply just sit and say, yeah, so-and-so, they're not here as much. I, you know, I hope they get things worked out. We, uh, go get them. Go after them. Well, I don't want to drive them away. They're not here anyway. You see, don't worry about making someone mad who is not right with God. Because as soon as they get mad enough and begin to deal with the sin in their heart, God will make them glad again. But we've got to go after them. You say, well, Pastor, do you think people should be in church all the time? Yeah, I do. I think Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I even think if you think about church, you ought to, you ought to come. You ought to get with somebody. Listen, we need to be in the house of God. You say, well, can I worship where I am? Yes, of course you can and you should. But there's nothing like coming together with God's people. Okay? Even God's people you don't necessarily like. Just come and be with them, okay? And you might learn to like them. Now, here's, here's what we need to see here. Uh, the time has not come, and so here they are. God saying to them, you have your own houses. And in verse 5, what does he tell them? He says, now consider your ways. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's a, we would probably just say, think about your life. Consider your ways. But literally, it has to do with, think about the road you're on. Think about where you're headed. Think about where this is going to lead you if you continue with this. We ought not to just simply say, well, you know, yeah, there's some things about my life that I don't like. No, consider the road you're on. Where are you going? What's going to happen if you continue on? You know, I've asked people that question, and they'll say, well, I don't know. I'll probably be in trouble. I said, no, 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 no. You will not be in trouble. You will be dead. The wages of sin is death. You will be dead both physically and spiritually. You see, you have to tell people where they're going, what's going to happen to them. You see, uh, here they are, they are, uh, uh, God says, consider your ways. And in verse 6, 
what does he tell them? He goes, here's your problem. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you are not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that putteth, and he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. You ever felt like that? <laughs> he says, here you are, ignoring the house of God, and you are planting your crops, but nothing is growing. And he says, you drink, but you're not filled. You don't have enough. You have clothes, but you're not warm. You don't have enough clothing. You don't have proper clothing. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. We might call that a purse or a wallet, okay? It has holes. In it. It's like you're putting it in and it's going right out. I've had pockets like that in suits. You know, you put in things in your pockets for so long and find that it wears a hole and you're looking for your keys and people are wondering, what's wrong with him? He's digging all around his coat and trying to find them because they've fallen into the hole that's there. And that's what people are doing. They're, 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 they're saying, we've got to earn some money. We've got to make some money. We've got to build something for our families. We've got to, you know, you know plan for our retirement. We've got to do all this stuff. And you don't have anything because where is it going? Who knows? You ever felt like that? No matter how much money you have, it's not enough because you're spending it and you don't know what you're spending it on. And then I will tell you, here's, here's something that I've learned. And uh, you might disagree with it, but I want you to think about it. Most of the time, when a Christian is having problems with money, they're not making enough, they're not doing, is there's, a, there's some disobedience somewhere in the area of their finances in their life. If you're not giving to the Lord, you're never going to have what you think you need to have. It's going to go. There'll be holes in the bag. I've seen people who have said, I can't really afford to give, and then there is sickness that comes up and they have to spend money at the doctor, or their car breaks down and they have to spend money to get it fixed or this happens, or that happens, and that money that they were holding on to is gone. I had one lady tell me years ago, she said, you know, I didn't think we could afford to give an offering every Sunday because my husband wasn't working very much, and so we would only give once in a while. And then we had some car problems, and we had some other things happen in our house. And she said, I added it up the other day, and it's, and it's what we would have given had we given it. God will get what's His. It's not that God wants the money. God does not not want your money because He says, gosh, who, you know, who's going to pay the lights up here in heaven? No, what is He doing? He is saying, you need to give because if you don't, you will never learn to trust. And how do we learn to trust? Trusting God is not simply adding Him on to what we're doing and saying, okay, you know, I have my good job and I have this going, my health insurance is really good and I have a nice car and I have all this stuff. And, I, and yeah, and I also trust God too. No. God says, no, you, learned to need to, you need to learn to trust me. So let's start taking all of that away till I'm all you have. And when He is all you have, and you learn to trust him, guess what he does? He begins to give to you the other things. But when you start relying on those other things and start bragging about them and start acting like, hey, I'm really something, he'll say, no, 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 you need to learn to trust me again. I'm telling you, this is how God works. You say, well, how do you know that? Did you read it in a book? No, I lived it. And what's, what's really sad is it because there's a reason why God calls us sheep? I've had to learn that lesson again and again and again. What's really said is that you are relearning the lesson that you know that you already know how to live, and you're telling yourself, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. These people had to learn. They had to trust God, and they had to put Him first 
Otherwise, they were not going to have anything. So the Lord says in verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You look for much, and lo, it came to little, and when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains, upon the corn, upon the new wine, upon the oil, upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. Well, God tells them, I'm the one who did this. I am the one who did this to you. I'm the one who blew on everything you have, and I did it. Why? Because my house is lying waste. Think God takes it seriously, his house? Yes, he does. Takes it very, very seriously. And so we need to we need to think about this because you know we love the Lord and we want to do what is right. Um, you know, and part of this had to do with the fact um, that these people also were not. Uh, they were kind of embarrassed. Why? Because the house, we're going to see that later on, but the house that they were building was kind of shabby looking. It wasn't really very fancy. It was just, we got by. It wasn't, and because they're comparing it with what? With Solomon's temple, there was nothing like it. And they can look back and remember this temple and the old ones among them who are still alive can remember the temple. This is not anything like Solomon's temple. But later on we're going to see that God says it's going to be a much more glorious temple. Why was this temple going to be so glorious? I was talking to a guy the other day and he said, well, it was glorious because, because the Lord is going to establish, uh, you know, Temple sacrifices again one day, and that's the glory. That, well, that temple's long gone. Okay, you know why the temple they were building was going to be so much more glorious? Who was dedicated in that temple at age eight days old? Jesus. Who at the age of twelve was in that temple talking with the doctors and the Pharisees and those? Jesus. Who was it? that was in those temple that drove the money changers out, Jesus. Who was it that said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, Jesus. And who warned them this temple is going to come down, Jesus. The temple was glorious that they were building because he is coming in. Isn't that amazing? See, we kind of, I don't know whether we have the idea or whether we have any idea at all that, that where these temples came from is that, you know, they just throw one up and just, let's build it. We got a, got a weekend free. Let's, let's build a temple. No, it took years to build these temples. Everything had to be exact. They were following the plan that had been laid out from the tabernacle on. I mean, they're building it the way God said to build it. That's why the priests had to be there so they could build it the right way. But it was for the glory of God. As I say, we do not have a temple, but we have a house of God. Where is the temple today? Oh, look around the room. We're the temple of God, are we not? I always laugh, and I've told you this before, and I hope you never forget it, because who knows what will happen one day. But when people want to start telling you about a rebuilt temple that's going to happen, and why would we go back? to what God says not to do in the book of Hebrews? Why would we go back there and redo a whole system that he threw out? It makes no sense when we're the temple. We're the temple of God. 
You see, it's amazing if we just read the Bible for what it says and not try to throw any of this hickory dickory dock stuff into it. You know, I believe this and that. No, just, you know, it's what it says is what it says. And we may or may not get it right. You know, I, I love to sometimes answer people's questions and, and uh, or um, you have to pray for me because sometimes I will, you know, I see what people write on something and I'll think, you know, do they not read the Bible? And so somebody was talking about, you know, uh, slipping into hell. And this guy says, you don't slip into hell. You don't, don't slip into hell. God will put you in hell, but you don't slip into hell. And so I had to. I went to Psalm 73 where it talked about slipping in their foot in due time shall slide and into destruction. I said, that sounds like slipping into hell. Listen, what, what does that mean? It doesn't mean you're like you're just walking along and you slip like on some ice. But you are slipping, meaning what? You're not paying attention to what's really happening in your life. You're thinking you're just going along, living your life, and you can get right with God anytime you want to. You're slipping in. You're slipping in. And I'm praying that we will be a faithful people in everything. Amen? Man, we'll just, that everything about this place, even as old as it is, everything about this place ought to say, this is for God. I remember years ago uh, when we worked with another ministry and sometimes the people would come in here and they would say, you know, you come in here and you sense the presence of God. And I said, you do? One lady says, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just what it is. But she said, you can sense that God is worshipped here. I said, well, you should come every Sunday. You should tell everybody that. Listen, it's not about what it looks like, but it's about the attitude of the people who worship there. May God help us in that. Well, let's stop there because I want to pick up next week on the rest of this. Um,